Dysmenorrhea, or menstrual pain, is the most common menstrual symptom among adolescent girls and young women, and it unfortunately often goes under-recognized and under-treated by both patients and providers. It is extremely common, with 50 to 90 percent of teens suffering from painful periods. Most adolescents experiencing dysmenorrhea have primary dysmenorrhea, meaning they have painful menstruation in the absence of any pelvic pathology. It typically begins when adolescents reach their ovulatory cycles, usually within six to 24 months after menarche, and the etiology is thought to be due to an overproduction of prostaglandins, which stimulate increasing myometrial contractility and pain. And we know that dysmenorrheic women have higher levels of prostaglandins compared to eumenorrheic women. Classically, when teens present, they will report a very predictable temporal pattern occurring just before and during menstruation. Pain will often radiate to the back and to the thighs. Um, it often may be accompanied by systemic symptoms including diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, and this is a common misconception amongst patients and providers that when there's that degree of pain, there must be some underlying pathology when in fact it's just primary dysmenorrhea, painful periods. And unfortunately, it's the leading cause of recurrent short-term absence from school for young adolescent girls. When you have a patient that presents to you, the initial evaluation should absolutely involve a detailed medical, menstrual, and family history, and also a psychosocial history to determine whether the symptoms are indeed suggestive of primary or possibly secondary to dysmenorrhea with something else going on. Generally, a pelvic examination is not necessary. And when the patient's history meets those, that criteria and suggests primary dysmenorrhea, absolutely empiric treatment should be started. The treatment of choice for primary dysmenorrhea should begin with non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, which are definitely considered first-line treatment, basically to interrupt prostaglandin production. There are good systematic reviews demonstrating the clear efficacy of NSAIDs across the board with relief in 60 to 90% of patients. Essentially, all NSAIDs are equally effective, so the choice of medication really can be based more on patient cost and the availability to the patient. The key, though, is to administer a loading dose, essentially a double dose, ideally one to two days before the onset of Munsees, if you can predict it, and then to continue that medication on a scheduled basis through at least the first two to three days of bleeding. Unfortunately, despite NSAID therapy, 10 to 15% of teens won't respond to NSAIDs, in which case we will then add in hormonal medication. And the mechanism behind hormonal medication is to also suppress ovulation and thereby further reduce proliferation of the endometrial lining, further reduce the volume of prostaglandin production, menstrual flow, and then ultimately pain. Now, patients who fail three to six months of empiric therapy for primary dysmenorrhea or those who have symptoms right off the bat suggesting secondary dysmenorrhea, those require further evaluation. And by secondary dysmenorrhea, I basically mean painful periods that is due to pelvic pathology, most commonly endometriosis. Symptoms of secondary dysmenorrhea include progressively increasing pain since that first period. It may occur outside of the menstrual cycle. It's not relieved with NSAIDs and or hormones hormonal therapy, and also that patient may report a family history of endometriosis. Family history should absolutely raise a suspicion as patients with an affected first degree relative have about a seven to tenfold increased risk of developing endometriosis. For these patients then, if you're suggesting and thinking there may be something more going on based on that history, that's when you want to consider an examination and pelvic imaging, including a pelvic ultrasound. And essentially what we're looking for on the ultrasound are other causes, including infection, tubo ovarian abscess, ovarian cysts, or in the rare patient, even an obstructive reproductive tract anomaly. Among the various causes of secondary dysmenorrhea, endometriosis is the leading cause in adolescents. The exact prevalence is unknown, but we know that at least 60 to 70 percent of adolescents with chronic pelvic pain or dysmenorrhea that is unresponsive to that empiric therapy with hormonal therapy will be diagnosed with endometriosis at the time of their diagnostic laparoscopy. 
It's important to note, though, that endometriosis absolutely remains a surgical and pathologic diagnosis. You do need to take these young women to surgery, and you do need to get a biopsy to confirm your suspicions. Because of the need for surgery, patients and families should be counseled about the risks and benefits of a diagnostic laparoscopy, and we utilize here at Children's Colorado a shared decision-making process, really talking through the risks and benefits and whether now is the right time to move forward with a laparoscopy. Some patients and families will just opt to continue with medication for a while longer, but we find a lot of our patients are really desperate for an explanation for their pain and they are ready for surgery. It's also important to note that the appearance of endometriosis may be different in an adolescent versus an adult. They often show clear vesicles and red lesions, which are very different from the adult, and it may be difficult to identify by a gynecologist who's unfamiliar with the appearance of endometriosis in teens. Endometriosis in adolescence is unfortunately a chronic disease with a potential for progression if it's left untreated. So the goals of therapy are really threefold. One, we wanna of course get symptom relief for the patient. Two, we wanna help suppress disease progression. And then three, ultimately, we absolutely wanna protect that adolescent's future fertility. So we employ more of a conservative surgical therapy that's individualized and then maintain ongoing suppressive medical therapy to prevent that endometrial proliferation and progression. Medical therapies include prescribing either cyclic or continuous birth control pills. There's progestin-only options, including the levonorgestrel IUD. We use the IUD more and more for our young women for contraception, but there's been good evidence in Cochrane reviews demonstrating the benefit and efficacy of the levonorgestrel IUD for young women with endometriosis. Long term, it's important, we know that we really need a multimodal approach to these patients. And we, at this point, given the chronic pain that can develop, involve our multidisciplinary teams with biofeedback, our pain management teams, and psychosocial counseling. Here at Children's Colorado, our adolescent gynecology department is dedicated to helping teens get the help they need with their painful periods, including the appropriate medical treatment, a timely surgical evaluation, and then the long-term collaborative follow-up um, with our entire care team.